And we are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, I already can see first attendees rolling in. That's great. So welcome to this uh, platform engineering meetup with Liz Funk Jones. Already the second time, we are very excited about that. And welcome to you guys. I see we already have lots of attendees. Probably use the chat to say hi. And uh, also probably where you're located at the moment. Can see Anthony, hi. David, Daniel, good to see you. Great. So uh, we will give this a few more minutes so that people have time to join. I'm happy to uh, guide you through the housekeeping rules. Um, so this webinar or meetup is going to be recorded. We are happy to share the recording tomorrow in an email with you. Also the slides uh, Liz will be presenting. Um, besides that, please uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. We will gather them and then um, later uh, after the talk, this will have the opportunity to uh, to answer your questions. Please uh, use the Q&A for that, uh, would be great. And if you uh, want to post something in the chat, then make sure uh, that you post to everyone and not only to the panelists, that would be great. So the others uh, can also see. Cool. So I would say to get also a bit better understanding uh, of who is joining today, I would love to uh, run a quick poll with you uh, about your background, just uh, whether you have more an SRE, a platform engineer, application developer, or product manager background, so that we are a bit aware of uh, who's joining us today. And I already can see a lot of answers, but it's pretty, pretty not that many product managers we have, <laughs> but uh, a lot of SRE and platform engineer folks. That's great. Cool. So yeah, I can see that most of the people seem to be ready. And here comes another poll about some observability terminology. So how I wish we could have made it multiple choice, but you know. Yeah. How do you think about implementing observability in your current setup? And we have APM metrics, logging, and tracing. Yeah, and many are interested in metrics. Uh, we already can see. That looks good. And I think now we're already close to 50 people, which is really great. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, I think metrics is the absolute uh, favorite one with close to 60%, uh, followed by APM and tracing. Um, I would say I end this poll. 
And I'm very happy to hand over to you, Liz. And we're excited about your talk now. The floor is yours. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so that's really interesting to see that you all are uh, huge fans of metrics. I am here today to change your mind about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some of the lessons I've learned over my 15 years of being a site reliability engineer of some kind or another. Um, and we're going to be talking about two key components to how to achieve better outcomes uh, as a site reliability engineer or platform engineer. So I think the fundamental truth is that a lot of the software engineers that we work with um, think that you know, you're writing code, you commit your code, and it's done. But we know better than that. We know that the job is not done until it is actually running successfully in production, that just lending in source control is not enough. But there are a lot of barriers that exist to people being able to successfully run their code in production. And that's why historically a lot of that load has fallen onto systems engineers, sysadmins, DevOps engineers, whatever the current title of the day is for person who handles the ops work. Um, we kind of have to figure out how do we spread that load across without overwhelming the people uh, who are developing the product with complexity when we're asking them to take on operational responsibilities for what they run. And this is especially true when you are trying to use microservices, where there's now no longer one service that one person keeps their head. It's a lot of different services flying information run by different teams. And it takes a lot of complexity to scale out our services. Some of it is necessary complexity, and some of it is unnecessary complexity or technical debt. But like, the reality is that we cannot rely on kind of keeping that knowledge in one person's head or relying on heroism to maintain things. So how do we cope with this? Well, one way that we can cope with this is by examining the idea of reliability as one of our responsibilities and thinking about what does it really mean to deliver uptime, right? Does it mean that our services have to be perfectly available? Does it mean that our individual servers have to be perfectly available? And I would argue the answer is, you know, no, the services do not have to be uh, perfectly reliable. The servers don't have to be perfectly reliable. It's certainly true that, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was 10, 15 years ago, I was running a, uh, the servers for a game studio. And if the database server was up and the game world server was up, everything was happy. And if not, everything was sad, but things are no longer so binary. And we cannot wait for users to complain to us before we say that um, that things are working correctly um, or working incorrectly. We have to be a little bit more proactive than that. And we have to, reliability is not just the only constraint that we have. We also have to think about delivering features, about adding scalability to the platform and many other different considerations. So in the past, you would say, you know, okay, let's hire one platform engineer, or let's hire one SRE, or let's hire a team of SREs and let's have them do on call. But that does not work anymore. We have to make sure that people are able to, larger teams of people are able to run production and maintain that feedback loop. So what's our strategy? What is our recipe for getting out of this mess? You might think the answer is by tools, um, but Funnily enough, I work at a company that provides tooling and I am here to tell you not to buy tooling. Um, don't try to buy DevOps. DevOps does not come in a nice box that you can buy. Um, if you try, this is what's gonna happen. You will add more and more and more tests um, and your test coverage meter will look perfectly green, but your test will get more and more flaky. CI and CD mean that, you know, if you don't actually measure quality with CI and CD and you're focused on shipping shit faster, you will ship shit faster. With infrastructure as code, um, if you have ever run rm-rf star uh, slash uh, before, now imagine doing that to your entire infrastructure by mistake. And Kubernetes, the juice is not necessarily worth the squeeze, right? Like it's don't do Kubernetes just because someone like me stands up on a conference stage and tells you to do it, right? Like you have to think about, is this complexity worth it for my environment? Does it actually make things better? But the cardinal sin that I see people committing is I see people um, just saying, you know, hey, I heard about this idea of production ownership, of just putting all of the devs on call of PagerDuty that creates this virtuous feedback cycle. That's 
kind of true, but it's not really true. Why? Well, if you take someone who is not a grizzled systems engineer like me, and you throw them on call and their systems start learning every day at 2 a.m., they're going to turn off the pagers, they're going to demand to be let off the on-call rotation, or they're just going to quit your company, right? Turns out that engineers really do not enjoy being put on call if they've never been put on call before, especially if the system is poorly trained, poorly tuned, and they don't have the tools required to deal with a system that's doing that. So if you have noisy alerts and grumpy engineers and the pager is going off at 2 a.m. every day, like what happens next? Well, okay, let's suppose that you are the, you know, one engineer who actually feels motivated to investigate that page at 2 a.m. rather than going back to sleep. And you pull open your wall of dashboards uh, from your fancy monitoring tool. And you realize that there's not just one dashboard, there's 20 dashboards, and each dashboard has 20 different graphs on it. Which line wiggle at the same time as the other line? Is one causation? Is the other correlation? Is this just a random flake? How do I even know? How do I even know where to start debugging or how to figure out what's going on? Sure, if you happen to be the expert who wrote the system, great. But most of the time, it's not going to be the expert who's on call. It's going to be some random engineer who doesn't have an idea of what all these graphs mean. And often, these graphs refer to the last outage that we had or the last 10 outages we had, which does not necessarily predict our next outage. And while we're staring at these dashboards, it, take, it takes forever for engineers to figure out like, you know, what's going on and customers are unhappy. Customers are, are, waiting for, uh, are, are waiting for us to fix it. Okay, so finally it gets to be 3 a.m. and you call up your grizzled tech lead like me and we sleepily yawn and answer the phone because this is like, we're not on call every week. We're on call every week, if you know what I mean. Like, you may not get paid every night at 2 a.m., but you get woken up at 3 a.m. by an escalation once a week or once every other week. And it gets really, really tiring. You can't take a vacation. It kind of sucks. Okay, so the, let's suppose that the expert figures out what's going on and you deploy a, a temporary fix and it gets to be 8 a.m. and you sleepily go and you know get your coffee and you go, go back to work um, and you're like, Okay, now we need to deploy a longer lasting fix, but oops, I can't actually deploy my system because the deploy pipeline, every individual component is green, but as soon as I deploy it all together, it all gets rolled back because the joints, the connective tissue between the pieces of the system are broken in production and therefore the hundred changes that have piled up are unreleasable. Well, that's no good. So all of this is really, really stressful. If you're in a state where there's no time to do projects because you're just firefighting all the time, and even when you find a spare hour or two, you can't figure out like, okay, what should I be doing to dig myself out of this pit of operational despair? So this is a state that we call operational overload. It's where you're struggling to hold on, you're barely like holding on by your fingernails to the, to the rock face. Um, and you don't really have the ability to run your system. So what's missing? Like, what should we be doing differently? And honestly, I think this is where, uh, you know, where my thinking very much aligns with Humanitex, right? Like that we need to think about how are we providing people with the right ability to solve the problem? And it all starts with the people. Too often, if you adopt a tools first methodology, you, you've kind of lost sight of who's going to be using these tools. Like, does it form a coherent whole? Does it actually solve the real problems of the people who are operating the system? And a lot of the time, the problems are not actually uh, technical. For instance, I'm telling this story about the engineer who's woken up every night at 3 a.m., who's like stressed out, who can't figure out what's going on. I live that. My heart rate is going up right now. And the most important thing I can do is not adopt a tool. The most important thing that I can do right now is take care of myself. So I'm going to do that. Right? That feels so much better. When you look after yourself first, then the rest will flow. So how do we get to a state where instead of being on a collision course, where your new tools are paging you and stressing you out, how do we instead make it so your tools are facilitating what you want to do? 
Well, the key thing that you need to do is to identify what is it that we're trying to achieve and then figure out what tools are going to go along with that and facilitate the journey rather than adopting tools that are going to be at odds with what we're trying to do. So that means that we need to invest first in our people and our culture and our processes before we think about tooling. So that's what today's talk is about. Today's talk is about production excellence. It's about thinking about how do we, uh, how do we run our systems reliably and in a way that is not going to burn out our engineering teams to make our systems friendlier to operate. Now you don't get there by accident, you have to plan and you have to actually make sure that your KPIs are aligned with engineering happiness. And we have to do this as a cross-disciplinary effort, not just something that is an engineering thing. This is actually something that's going to involve everyone at your company or organization. And we have to make sure that we're starting from a place of psychological safety rather than blame. We have to make sure that people feel free to pipe up and really participate in this process. So what are the key elements of production excellence culture? So these are the four lessons that I learned from my time as a site reliability engineer that I want you to adopt in your organization. First of all, you have to know when your services are too broken. Secondly, you have to be able to debug. You have to be able to understand like why are they broken? And third, you have to be able to collaborate with other teams in order to repair the damage. And then fourth, you need to eliminate unnecessary complexity. You have to close that feedback loop and really address what's going on inside your system. So why did I say no when our systems are too broken? Why did I not say when no when our systems are broken at all? Well, the answer is that our systems are always failing. There's always some microscopic way in which our systems are, are broken. We wouldn't expect the grass on our lawn to be have every single blade of grass be green. So why are we expecting every query to succeed? All that matters is that the lawn is green enough for us to go and play, send our dog or our kids to play, right? So let's think about applying that to our services by measuring two broken. So this is the concept from site reliability engineering called the service level indicator or service level objective. So what an SLI or SLO does is it allows you to express a constraint about reliability in language that your product manager, your customers, and you as an engineer can understand. So in order to measure a SLI, you have to think about what are the critical user journeys that our customers are trying to achieve and what are relevant bits of context about those customers or about those journeys that we'll need in order to understand them better. And then we'll need to figure out which events are good and bad. For instance, is a individual transaction that took uh, 550 milliseconds and returned an HTTP 302, is that a good or bad event? Well, I don't know. One way of finding out is to ask your product manager about what the constraints are or ask your friendly user experience researcher, right? Like, what is too slow for our customers? Or if this you have work on a product that you can dog food yourself, just slow it down, deliberately introduce chaos and see at what point does it feel like it's too sluggish and then set your threshold there because that's what we're ultimately after. We're after something that a machine can use to categorize your events as good, bad, or not applicable. So for instance, I might decide that my service is running acceptably if it's serving requests that have an HTTP code of 200 and that's whose latency is less than 100 milliseconds. And then we want to understand what's the denominator, right? How many eligible events did we see? And we want to exclude our artificial health checks or synthetics. We'll want to exclude uh, our friendly neighborhood botnet. We're really only interested in the real customer experience as loaded by our clients. And then we can compute our availability percentage. What's the number of good events divided by the number of eligible events to figure out what our current actual achieved uptime is? And we can set goals on that. We can say this is what our target service level objective is. This is what the actual level, uh, this is what our ideal level of reliability is. Now you don't want to set it over one day or five minutes. You want to set it over a longer time period, like 30 or 90 days, because your customers have memories. Your customers will remember, you know, hey, like your site was down yesterday. You don't get perfect forgiveness for that until like 30 or 90 days down the road. So for instance, I might want to set a goal to have 99.9% .9 of events to be good over the past 30 days. That might mean that I'm trying to make sure that uh, out of out of all of the user journeys that happened, 99.9% .9 of them were served with an HTTP 200 in less than 100 milliseconds. So why not 100%? 
The answer is that you cannot aim for perfection without also aiming for infinite cost. In order to achieve 100% uptime, why, you have to launch satellites into orbit and provide every single customer with a custom satellite phone, right? Because cellular networks are not 100% reliable. Customers go into tunnels, right? Like there are a lot of things that can cause requests to fail. So it doesn't make sense to pursue infinite nines when the reality is that your customers will experience less than infinite nines anyways. And not only that, in addition to it costing infinitely much, it will also slow your product development to a crawl if you have to stop every time you introduce a single error. Instead, you need to decide what's an acceptable number of errors and is it okay for users to have to retry every now and then. So, you know, it turns out that setting a goal that's reasonable, you know, thinking about is my service have a requirement of, you know, three nines, four nines, five nines, right? Like, can it be down for four minutes a month? Can it be down for 40 minutes a month? Or does this really have to be down less than 400 milliseconds per month, right? There are different gradations. Your service is probably, probably not 911 or, uh, or, or, uh, or you know, the, the European equivalent, right? Like, so we have to think about what are the actual product requirements and then optimize for a combination of reliability and product velocity. So what do we actually do with this? Well, we don't just put the SLO up on a wall and look at it every couple of months. You can actually use SLOs to replace all of those noisy alerts. You think about it, if we define what acceptable enough is to our users, right? If we say, okay, it's reliable enough if 99.99% uh, of requests are served successfully, that means one in 10,000 is allowed to fail. So if I am serving 100 million requests per month, that means 100,000 of them uh, can fail if I am having, uh, if my target SLO is 99.9%. So that means if 100,000 are allowed to fail per month, and I'm having 100, uh, if I'm having 100 bad requests per hour, that's going to take 1,000 hours to run out. That's not an emergency. Whereas if I'm having you know, 10,000 bad requests per hour, I'm going to run through my error budget for the whole month in less than 10 hours, which means someone needs to wake up, someone needs to deal with that, right? So service level objectives allow you to be responsive if it genuinely is an emergency. But if there's one bad request out of one total request at 3 a.m., maybe it's not an emergency, right? You can wait, you can solve it during business hours, or maybe it's just a temporary flap. It's not the end of the world. So this is the real in incident that we had at Honeycomb. We had our ingest service, which has a four nines availability target. We were having brownouts. We were having one to 2% of requests fail for about 20 minutes every three hours. And it happened three times. And this blew our error budget. And we sent an alert to our engineers and we started looking at it. But our traditional black box monitor actually did not fire. Do you know why it didn't fire? Because it was waiting for two consecutive probes to fail in a row. And those probes were happening once per minute with a one or 2% chance of failure. That was not likely to happen to have two consecutive probes in a row fail. Whoops. So it turns out that the SLO is more tightly coupled to user experience, both in terms of avoiding false positives, but also in terms of avoiding false negatives. So SLOs can really clean up your alerting act, but they can also enable you to better navigate this tension of, am I moving too fast or am I moving too slowly? Do I have more freedom to run experiments? By having a quantitative idea of what reliability is, you can then make a decision about should I be moving faster or slower. If you've got plenty of error budget left, sure, feature flag something on for 1% of your users. Worst case, it fails, and you roll it back within five minutes. You've blown a little bit of your error budget, but you weren't aiming for 100% anyway, so you're good. Conversely, if you're having a lot of reliability problems, Agreeing on an SLO in advance allows you to go back to your product manager and say, you know what, we agreed reliability was important. Here's the threshold we set. We're violating that threshold. It doesn't matter how many new features you ship. Customers are not going to trust them unless they're actually reliable. So measure what you can, right? Like, I'm not saying your SLO has to be perfect. You just have to measure something or else what you don't know is going to hurt you. So yes, load balancer logs can be a good start, but you ultimately want to evolve 
and iterate to meet your user needs to better understand what's happening under the hood. So by only alerting on what matters, it'll allow you to get a peaceful night's sleep, which is pretty good. But there's another half to this, which is that what happens if the pager does go off? How do we actually remediate those issues? Because what I'm telling you is to get rid of that safety blanket of, you know, oh, we'll get alerted if the CPU on any one machine goes over 90%. What I'm saying now is instead you're getting alerted only if real users are experiencing pain, but how do you map real users experiencing pain to where in the system it's coming from? So this is where I'm going to introduce to you the idea of observability. That observability is a mechanism for tackling issues that are end known end knowns, where you don't know what has happened, but you need to be able to figure it out. Because if we're doing our job as engineers, our outages are never exactly the same. So we should be able to diagnose failures that we've never seen before, rather than just kind of doing rote work from playbook over and over and over again. If you knew the bug was going to happen, you wouldn't have written the bug in the first place, right? So every single failure in a mature system is a novel condition. So we have to be able to debug it in production. My boss, Cherry Major, she gets a lot of flack sometimes for saying, you know, test in production. She's not saying don't test in staging. What she's saying is you are testing in production whether you like it or not. The question is how good are you at doing it? Because if you're not good at testing in production, you wind up having to spend weeks reproducing issues in staging, and that's weeks that your customers are suffering. We have to make sure that we're using the same consistent set of data rather than saying, oh, it's green on my dashboard. I don't understand why you're saying there's a problem. Your customers are not going to accept that as an answer. And we have to enable what we call the core analysis loop, the idea that we should be able to form and test hypotheses about our system as a mechanism for debugging and figuring out what's going on. So we have to be able to dive into data and slice and dice it in order to ask and answer new questions. Not, you know, hey, I generated this metric, uh, you know, three months ago or a year ago, and it has, you know, these fixed dimensions. But to be able to slice and dice that data to be able to break it down by any dimension I'd like with any cardinality, with any values that, that might be applicable. So not just machine ID or build ID, but also the combination of machine and user ID and language and locale, right? Like all of these things might be relevant dimensions. So all of this is to say that our services have to be observable. We have to be able to understand a novel failure inside of our system without pushing new code, without adding a new printf debug statement. All of the data needs to already be emitted by our system. So we're going to need, as I said earlier, right? Like events corresponding to our SLIs, but we need the context around them. What was happening inside our system while that request was executing? So this is where a distributed trace can be really helpful because it'll provide you with causation and, and context, right? So I can understand why did this request to Honeycomb's query engine take 200 milliseconds? Well, it took 200 milliseconds because of, of the longest uh, individual subquery. Which query was the individual subquery that was so slow, et cetera, et cetera. These are questions that we can answer if we have the kind of idea of what called what called what. But it's not just having the causation and correlation. We also have to think about being able to differentiate slow from fast requests to be able to explain the variance. For instance, to be able to pinpoint that it's one particular tenant and it's one user within that tenant and that it's one specific kind of request that they're issuing that's causing this error. Right, that by being able to do that, we're able to answer questions that a traditional metric system would not be able to answer. A traditional metric system might be able to tell you that you're having an elevated rate of errors on the specific endpoint, but it won't be able to tell you who, because the idea of who might cause your metric system to overload. Even better yet, why do we have to catch it in the app? Why can we not automatically mitigate these issues and then look at it with a cup of coffee on our desks at 9 a.m. in the morning instead of having to look at it right in the app at 3 a.m.? But observability is not just break fix. Observability is the whole life cycle from writing code to making sure our CI is performant to understanding what our users are actually doing with it to understanding like, what are the single points of failure? Where do I have circular dependencies? The other misconception I often see is people say, observability is logs, traces, and metrics. No, observability is not just the data. 
And in fact, you don't have to have all three of logs, traces, and metrics to have observability. Instead, what you need to have is the ability to instrument your code to be able to understand it later. And to do so as easily as adding a printf debug statement. You have to be able to store the data somewhere where it's not going to break the bank. But most importantly, you have to be able to query that data to answer that question. For whom does life suck and why? So SLOs and observability go together because SLOs help you understand when things are too broken, and observability helps you explain why and remediate as quickly as possible. But we also have to think about a couple of other elements. We have to think about how do we collaborate across teams rather than depend upon individual heroes? How can we make sure that we're able to debug as a distributed team where we can no longer shoulder surf each other to be able to understand what's the state of affairs, how do we make it better? And not just across individual teams and members of those teams, but across multiple different teams, ranging from customer support to engineering to our cloud operations team. So we should do game days. We should actually practice this at 3 p.m. before we actually have to do it live at 3 a.m. And we have to make sure that people are working together smoothly rather than saying, oh, I can't believe you didn't know that. We have to make sure that people are able to not get burnt out, that people are able to step back if they're getting crispy and that someone else can take their place, which means that we need to raise everyone to the level of the best debugger on the team rather than just burning out your best engineer. And we have to write the right amount of documentation. Not things that are going to be misleading or get out of date, but things that help you understand what is the service for, why should I care, and how can I quickly go and find the right observability signals about it. Your importance as an engineer is no longer the number of people lined out your door to ask you a question. Your importance as an engineer instead is how enduring the systems you write are and how scalable and maintainable they are by others. But let's at least start by making sure we're speaking the same language. Let's make sure we're using common observability frameworks like OpenTelemetry, which I talked about the last time that I was here on, at the Platform Engineering Meetup. We have to make sure that people are able to um, ask new questions and feel like they are getting good answers to those questions rather than feeling like, oh my god, I can't run this query or else I'm going to break the logging system and then no one else is going to be able to run a query. That's no good. Ugh. But I think the number one thing that we should remember is that we're not just working with our current coworkers, we're working with our past and future coworkers, including our future selves. So let's leave ourselves, uh, in the words of my friend Tanya Riley, let's leave ourselves cookies, not traps for the future. Because our addresses may not be exactly the same, but there are some commonalities. So we need to think about how are we making things as stable of a platform for future engineers. We need to do risk analysis. So we need to think about what is the frequency of risks and how bad are they? Every engineer that I know gets a shudder down their spine when you hear the words, the MySQL server. Well, it turns out that you can't necessarily affect how often the MySQL server goes down. You know in, in your heart of hearts that the MySQL server will break at some point in the next year, right? It's inevitable. Earthquakes happen once every 30 years, MySQL servers break once every year. But what you can affect is how bad is it? Does it take three hours to restore from tape? Or is it an instant failover to the standby server? Or does it impact 100% of your users? Or does it only impact 2% of your users at a time because you've sharded your database? So we can think about trying to address the most significant risks in order to make sure that we're really prioritizing our efforts. And how do we determine most significant? Well, we just had discussed the service level objectives, right? The number of good requests and bad requests. So we want to address anything that might cause us to be unable to meet our service level objective. Because if your known end knowns are bad enough that there's no room for end known end knowns, you're not gonna have a sustainable service. So make sure everything that you do know about is no more than half of your error budget to leave room for things that you don't know about in advance. And that gives you the business case to fix them because we've agreed, this is our service level objective. This is what we're trying to achieve. And here's what we're going to do if we are at risk of not achieving the SLO. Don't just have your kind of out, outage incident reports be a list of these are the 10 things that would have prevented this outage. Think instead about what's going to be the one or two most impactful things that you could see happening again and actually happening again, not just, you know, there's a 0.1% chance that happens again. So spending time working on things that matter rather than things that don't matter. But I'm going to call out two things in closing. 
that if you have a lack of observability, that may not appear as an individual line item on your list of risks, but it impacts every single other risk. Why? If every outage you have takes five hours to debug, rather than five minutes to debug, that's going to really, really impact the number of users impacted and the length of that outage. So the shorter you can make your outages, the better. You may not necessarily have control over how often you have outages. In fact, having a small micro outage is not the end of the world. What we should be doing is trying to decrease the impact of each individual outage rather than prevent outages as a whole. So let's really invest in observability to make sure that we understand what's happening inside of our systems to be able to more quickly debug them and set them right. And we also have to address the socio factors of the tech of the technical, right? To make sure that people are feeling like they can safely say, I think my change broke the build, or I think my outage caused, uh, I think my change caused that outage. So that people can feel free to speak up without fear of blame in order to kind of exercise that collaborative muscle and to remember that we're all on the same team here. We're all trying to make our service better for users. So you don't have to be a hero to run a successful service. You just have to have the right culture. And yes, sometimes the right tools can help. Um, but think about the culture first and then decide what tools are going to help you build that right platform for your developers to build on. So production excellence can really help you create that really excellent culture where engineers feel that it's safe to ship and that they're able to make forward progress. So measure when things are too broken with service level objectives, be able to debug effectively with good quality observability, collaborate across team boundaries in order to fix those issues, and then close the feedback loop and really make sure that any outages that might happen again that you're instituting the right measures to really defend in depth against systematic failures. So that's what I have to share with you today. Um, but I do want to point out that I have a book coming out. Uh, it's called Observability Engineering, and it's authored by myself, Shirley Majors, and George Miranda. And uh, you can visit the link from the QR code that's on your screen right now uh, in order to get a free copy of the book. Um, it is basically a fully finished manuscript, and it will also be in print in May, which I'm really excited about. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and turn to questions. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. That was a really uh, great talk and a lot of input. Uh, I guess we have to digest now. Um, if you have questions, please uh, post them in the Q&A. Um, uh, or if you are using the chat, uh, then uh, just make sure you post to everyone and not uh, just to host and panelists. Um, I would like to start with one question um, uh, because that was a yeah, lot of content, um, but uh, maybe we can go back uh, one step again. So if I'm uh, exploring this uh, uh, setup process uh, of how to define SLOs and how to measure, but also which kind of stakeholders within my organization I would need to get on board to get started somehow. Can you share a few more thoughts from your experience, uh, some do's or don'ts uh, that you came across? Yeah, um, I think the main thing with stakeholders on observability is to think about um, think about things in terms of how much developer time you waste right now on doing break fix work, right? How much time is spent scratching your head, figuring like you know why did this break, um, or how much churn do we have because of perceived lack of reliability? Um, so I think that those are things that can really move the needle in terms of getting people to understand that this is worth investing in a capability to improve your developer platform. Um, I think the other thing to, to emphasize is that observability is not a binary yes or no state, right? Like it is something that is continuously improved. It's similar to testability, right? Like you wouldn't say, you know, I, I have tests, great, my job is done, right? Like, or I don't have tests, there's 0% testability, right? Like, Instead, it's a continuous spectrum of how observable am I? How testable is my code? Mm. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have one comment here, but unfortunately, uh, not for everyone, but uh, Sohom is asking, uh, yeah, that the presentation was absolutely awesome and uh, how 
can you download the whole recording. So tomorrow we will send out a follow up email to all the attendees uh, with a link to the recording and also a link to the slides and a link to uh, yeah, the announcement of the uh, great book about observability engineering. My list, one more question. What could be your biggest tip for new people entering the SRE role? <laughs> Coming from- Ah, uh, what should we do for new people entering the SRE role? Um, I think that is something where you need to make sure you have alignment with all of your stakeholders. Um, it depends on whether you're the first SRE on a team or whether you are joining an existing SRE team. Um, if you are the first SRE on your team, it's going to be really important to earn the trust of the software developers working in the product because you alone cannot carry the entire effort. So instead, you need to really act as a force multiplier. Um, and definitely an easy way to get a lot of that initial traction is to help people set those SLOs, but that's going to require cooperation from your product managers as well, right? Like it's not just something that engineers have to define reliability on our own. We decide how to measure reliability once the reliability goal has been articulated. Um, so I think that's one tip. I think the other thing is make sure that you're not swamped by toil, right? Make sure you're not spending a majority of the time on break fix. Make sure you're always able to dedicate some time towards automation of things so that you are able to convert time that would be spent doing break fix into having the automation take care of it for you, which kind of generates this uh, virtuous feedback loop. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, David is asking another question. Yeah, how would you earn that trust from the management as an SRE? I guess. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that it kind of relies upon deciding, right? Like, what are your key metrics? What are, what are you responsible for? And I think that is, you know, do we even have SLOs, right? Like, and if we do have SLOs, making sure that you're empowered to defend them, because like, it would suck if, you know, you right, like, S3 should not get fired if there's a lack of reliability, right? Like, that's a signal that we need to revisit the reliability of the platform and invest more into it, right? Like, that's often something that's not necessarily directly within your control. But I definitely think that, again, like your relationships really matter as an SRE. You work through other people. So it's going to be really challenging to get anything done unless you're, you know, allocated enough resources and you have the trust of those people. Um, so, yeah, I, it really depends, again, on, you know, is there a someone who is responsible for the SRE um, community of practice or center of excellence, or are you genuinely the only SRE, right? Like, in general, I don't recommend people uh, who are new to this role take on the role of the first SRE in an organization, right? Um, mm -hmm. That leads too easily towards not having the trust that you need in order to make the kind of cultural changes that you need. Um, also, it kind of forces you to, at the same time, learn how to do the job and also learn how to manage up. Uh, and I think yeah. those two are very, very challenging to do at the same time. So my advice is, if you can, uh, start in an organization that already has an SRE community of practice, and then maybe think about becoming the first SRE in an organization. Yeah, I think that makes uh, a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, David, David also smiling here. Uh, we have another question about how SLOs can help to tune what is needed for observability to gather the correct data. Yeah, um, so I think basically this is where tracing and SLOs are a match made in heaven, um, or you know, tracing and, and SLOs are kind of peanut butter and jelly, right? Like they're great on their own, they go better together. Um, where your SLO should be measuring some property about the from the outside of the system in, right? You know, request from user comes in, right? Like your users don't care whether your your request fails because of a database error or a cache error or an application code bug, right? What they care about is their request fail. Um, so you should be measuring your SLOs from the outside of the system, but in order to be able to debug from the outside in, you need to have that, you need to have kind of the ability to break that things down granularly to understand why things failed. And that I think is a role naturally served well by distributed tracing. Um, so, Right, like I think that observability makes it easier. Observability data makes it easier to measure the right SLOs, and SLOs are better debugged with high quality observability. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 that's like asking you, know, the chicken come first or the egg come first, right? Like, I, yeah. think, I think you kind of need both. Yeah, yeah, 
<laughs> thanks, thanks for your answer. And uh, we have another Daniel, uh, and probably we take this as a last question because otherwise we'll run out of time. Uh, how do you engage uh, the engineers and PMs to define the SLOs? I think that's a yeah. Last um, there's this really great set of material from Google on how to do an SLO workshop. Um, yeah. I think it's called the Art of SLOs. Um, let me see if I can pull it up here. But yeah, basically, um, make sure everyone is in agreement about what an SLO is in the first place, um, and then and then go into okay, how do we define SLO specific to our service, right? Like you know what do we think is good enough or bad enough, which I think actually goes to Marco's question about chaos engineering, right? Like if you're not sure, add latency until it starts to feel thuggish and then you know that's not acceptable anymore, right? Like you kind of have to figure out, you know, which journeys are important and what makes those journeys flip from good enough to, oh my God, this is not okay. Like we can't have our customers suffer through this. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. Then, uh, I would say, yeah, that was a fantastic meetup. It was a pleasure uh, to have you here again, Liz. Uh, thanks uh, for the engaged uh, audience, for all your questions. Uh, I hope we could answer most of them. Tomorrow, we will send out the follow-up email. If you have further questions, just reach out to us. We are uh, also happy to answer them later. And um, now at the beginning, let me just make another really brief announcement. This is an exciting week because we launched PlatformCon. For those of you who haven't heard yet, it's the first uh, platform uh, engineering conference ever, uh, June 9th and 10th. And uh, yeah, check out the website, platformcon.com. A lot of great speakers, a lot of fantastic uh, talks around platform engineering, and we will provide you more information tomorrow in the follow-up email. And we are also still looking for speakers. So there's an open call uh, until, uh, I guess, April 10th. So if you come from the platform engineering space and want to share something with the community, please hand in your talk there. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Liz, again. Uh, it was awesome. And yeah, have a great day. Have a great evening, everyone. And then see you next week again. Bye.